praise the Lord. It's time to start. Thank you, Jesus. I got the pastor on the run. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's do that again. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I love you guys. Glad you're here. Welcome our new online friend, family. Uh, we're going to stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Everybody had a good day? Well, that sounds pretty good. Good. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. How many has got a prayer request by that lifted hand? Thank you, Lord. I don't say this very much, but let's do pray about the election. Uh, I found some information out there I did not know that if uh, voting is not counted on the right time, that this lady may step in position as president. So, you know, God's got a plan, but we still got to do our part. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning or this afternoon for your presence in this place. I thank you because you're still God, regardless of whatever comes or whatever goes. I thank you for every hand that was lifted up, Lord. God, that it will touch you in faith. And Lord, those that may be sick that's listening online or it's in our midst, I thank you for the touch of your hand in their life. I thank you for those, Lord, that may be discouraged, that you'll encourage them, Lord. I thank you, God, because you can do anything. You are God of many, many, many talents, and you can do anything. You can make things that seem to be impossible, possible. And I thank you tonight for your presence as we enter into this service. I love you, and I thank you for your mercy, and I thank you for your grace. And I thank you there, Lord, being with me on my journey through this life. Everybody that's in the sound of my voice, I thank you, Lord, for the path that you're taking them. Help us to hold on to your unchanging hand. And always know that we can be free in you, Lord, no matter where we've come from or where we're going or where our background is. We still belong to you. And I thank you tonight for what you're going to do, Lord. And I praise you for it. Bless the word of God. Bless our pastor. Bless this ministry, Lord. But most of all, help us to bless you and to lift you up and give you honor and give you glory to where you deserve it, Lord. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Somebody praise the Lord a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody love Jesus. Oh, that I can't still go through. Tell me what kind of a man would reach down his hand and do this for me. Oh. Who you used to be. You're not defined from where you. 
you come from or your background. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are not what people say that you are. Do you hear me? Turn around and look at somebody and say, I'm not what you say I am. You know, I have a nephew over here and he may call me, he may call me Judy, he may call me his aunt, he may call me a woman of God, he may call me a teacher, he may call me many things. And my mom called me Judy. But God called me by my name because I'm God's child. I'm a, I'm a daughter of the Most High God. It doesn't matter who people say that you are. It's who Jesus says that you are. Always remember wherever you go, it's not what the world says you are, but it's by the grace and the mercy of the Most High God. Woo, glory that I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the devil can't have you. You belong to God. We need to worship God tonight and realize I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's nothing, nothing impossible for my God. Do you hear me? Praise the name of the Lord. And as I listen to this minister preach, she said, when I was a freshman in high school, a freshman in a school, it was like a college. She said, I want to do my own thing. Can you hear me? And she said, I changed my name to DK. I didn't want to be called Priscilla. I changed my name. I wanted to be different. I wanted to meet different people. I stepped out of my shoes. I want to meet different people. She said she got everybody introduced her as DK, DK, DK. Everybody knew her as DK, DK. That's the nickname she chose. And she said one day she got sick with a fever. They had to call her mom to come to the school to get her. And when she got there, the mom said, I come to get Priscilla. She's sick. She said, who's Priscilla? Because everybody else knew her as DK. And so when her mom took her home, she said, after a few days after she got better, listen to this. This is where this touched me. And we say this a lot. Her mom said, you know, we, we went along with what you wanted to change your name to DK. But she said, when you walk up where to get that diploma, there better not be no DK on that diploma. She said, because I want to tell you something. Nobody can name you except who gave birth and life to you. Do you hear me? Nobody can name you but who gave life to you. And honey, Jesus gave life to me. And he wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm a daughter of the Most High God. So it don't matter what the world says you are. It matters what God says you are. Somebody clap your hands real big for Jesus.
enemy tells you do you believe about yourself? And I said, a lie that I believe at times, not always, um, is that because of my past I'm not good enough to do what God has called me to do. And she said, do you not realize what he's, what he's called you to do? Do you not realize if God didn't believe in you, then he wouldn't have called you to it? So I just feel like like Judy's talking about <laughs> It's heavy um, that somebody feels like maybe they're not good enough for God. And I just want you to know that that's a lie of the enemy. So whatever God is calling you to do, even if, if it's to be the best clapper in the world, you just be the best clapper in the world. If it's to be um, somebody that has the best smile when they walk into church, be the person that has the best smile when you walk into church. If you don't know what God's calling you to do, pray and ask the Lord because He is calling His people to a higher standard. What the devil says about us, it doesn't matter what people say about us, it does not matter. It only matters what God says about us. And He says that we are His, He says that we are redeemed, He says that we are worthy, He says that we're enough, and we don't have to listen to the enemy anymore.
Lord, that you make the darkness tremble. That at your, at your voice, demons have to flee. We thank you, Lord, that when we lift your name on high, God, that you give us power to tread over serpents. We thank you, Lord, that we are your children, God, and that you said that nothing shall by any means harm us, Father God. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for each and every person that's represented here tonight, God. I thank you for the people who aren't here, God, that are represented in this church family, God. I pray, Lord, that you'll cover us with your blood, Jesus. I pray, God, that no demonic stronghold shall overtake us, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you will remind us who we are, God. We are your children, Father God. That you are concerned about anything that concerns us. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that we get to be your children, God. We thank you, Lord, that we have an inheritance in your name, Jesus. The name that's above every name, King of kings and Lord of lords, in whom we have all belief, God, we lift you high tonight. We praise your name tonight, Jesus. Your name is so sweet and so precious, God. And there is no other name under heaven that we can be saved by, God. So we lift your name. We praise your name. And in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as Pastor John comes to bring the word. <laughs> praise the Lord, church. My Lord, how many glad to be in church on this Wednesday night? the Lord. I'm excited, church. I mean, my Lord, uh, we, uh, we don't uh, really do this a whole lot, but I enjoy it when we get the opportunity. So I'm going to get set up a little bit up here. Is that all right? Yes. Praise the Lord. You know, as I'm, as I'm getting this together, I got to set for my, uh, some of my little uh, quirks, I guess. But uh, <laughs> as we're getting all this set up and all this together, um, the thing is, uh, somebody asked me uh, a while back, they were like, you know, what is the, uh, is, is there anything you miss about before you were pastoring? And the first thing that came to mind, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, you know, uh, one of the things that I don't do as much of as what we used to have the opportunity to do is teach. And so I thought about that as I was preparing for this message because this is going to be one of the messages tonight, church, where we're going to do a little bit of teaching and a little bit of preaching. Is that all right? I'm, I'm excited because I know where God's taking us. And remember, uh, we have said a lot of things about where we're going, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Mm, 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 mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1. Some very familiar scriptures, and we are probably going to be sitting right here for the next couple services, actually. But uh, we are definitely going to be sitting here tonight. So, uh, like I say, some very familiar scripture. I appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Look at your neighbor and smile real big and say, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> now find a neighbor that don't live in the same house and say, I'm glad to see you too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> we welcome our online family in on this Wednesday night. We appreciate you all tuning in. Praise the Lord. But we're going to start reading in verse number five. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you. Nobody got scared right there, did you? <laughs> Do not be afraid of them. <laughs> For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Let's pray. 
Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we're thankful for your presence here tonight, God. Lord, we thank you for, Lord, for everything that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. And, Lord, we thank you that this word tonight is going to fall on good ground, God. Lord, that it's going to help mold us and make us and help us grow in to what you would have us to grow into becoming. Lord, we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise for all that you're doing in our midst. In Jesus' name. And the church says... Praise the Lord. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> but, uh, now, we have been in an extremely helpful series for the past several weeks called Come Grow With Me. And I got to say, church, if it hadn't been for anybody else, this has definitely been for me. Is that okay? Can I preach to myself sometimes, church? I, I, I need this. As I was studying to prepare for this series, the Lord showed me some things in my own life from my past that's caused me to take a good hard look in the mirror and grow and take more steps to becoming closer and to becoming more of what he's trying to mold me and make me into. In other words, what I'm saying is, if this series hadn't blessed anybody else, it's truly blessed me and it's helped me to become a better version of me. Is that all right, church? Ain't that what we all trying to do is become a better version? There's a better me on the inside of me that I haven't met yet and I'm trying to get to where I can meet that better me. Now, we've been looking at some stuff that have times, honestly, it hadn't been easy, but it's been helpful and it's been impactful, and I believe we can all grow from the word that the Lord has been giving. Has anybody else been enjoying this series? Has it helped anybody? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So we told you at the beginning that for the next several weeks that this, this sanctuary is going to be a hospital. And we're going to do some surgery on three different areas. Now, this past Sunday morning, we closed out the first part of the operation when we closed out the section on rejection. Okay, tonight we're going to start operating on the second area of focus. But before we do, i got to give you an idea of where the Lord's taking us for the next several weeks. Now, I know I mentioned this a little bit Sunday night, but I just got to share this with you. You see, for the next several weeks, probably mid-October, first part of November, end of October, middle of November, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, what we're going to be doing is... Um, we're going to start tonight on the second area of focus, and unless the Lord goes a different route this upcoming Sunday morning, uh, we're going to go and continue with this train of thought, and then after that, we're going to have one more service dealing with the second area of focus. Then unless the Lord goes a different route, once we close this part out, starting uh, probably about first part to the middle of September, we're going to start a Sunday morning and a Sunday night series. The Sunday morning series is going to be straight fire. You don't want to miss it. If it's Jesus, tell him I said hello. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but Sunday morning is going to be a series on our identity called Who Am I? And it's going to be straight fire. There's a lot of things the Bible says who we are, but we need to understand who we are and why we are. I told some folks, I said this, I think, a few services ago. We've got to figure out who we're not before we can figure out who we are. So that's why we do surgery now. So here in a few weeks, we're going to be stepping into who we are. We're stepping out of who we ain't, and we're stepping into who we are. And then on Sunday nights, we're going to do a series called Everything I Know About Relationships I Learned From Sports. Now, some of you women is curling up your noses. Just think about this. How else am I going to get through the thick skulls of all us men in here? Praise the Lord. <laughs> and guys, for all you that's looking at me funny now, think about it. How else am I going to get them here to hear something about sports? There we go. Hey, all right. So. <laughs> but you don't want to miss it. It's going to be awesome, I promise. But now I know there might be somebody that's trying to shut me out, but it's going to be great. And tonight we're going to move into our second area of focus. And tonight what I want to talk to you about is this subject, insecurity. Insecurity. <laughs> and we probably, like I say, we're probably going to do some teaching and we're probably going to do some preaching tonight. Is that okay? So let's get into this word. As we move into the introduction tonight, church, I feel like I need to point out that the first step to solving any problem is to see the problem. Does that make sense? You cannot solve what you will not see. Somebody needs to say amen right there. 
Now, I realize it's Wednesday night and everybody's tired, and it might have already been a long week, but since we're already at church, we might as well go ahead and have church. Is that okay? Let's just have church tonight. Who wants to have church with me tonight? But you cannot solve what you cannot see. We cannot address what we have not identified. And I believe that's why a lot of Christians are walking around in some very dark places and some very bad spaces because they have not or they will not identify what issues exist. That mask that a lot of us wear, the more difficult it is whenever we wear that mask, the more difficult it is to walk in the freedom that Jesus wants us to walk in. Am I making sense? And this is why I believe one of the strategies of the enemy is to keep us in the dark about the issues that we're wrestling with that hinder us from experiencing the abundant life Jesus wants us to live. Because, see, the fact is we might not be wrestling with natural things, we might not be wrestling with physical things, but we are still wrestling. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, we ain't wrestling flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. Let me add a little bit. I know I'm not adding to the word of God, but I'm going to interject it right here. But we do wrestle. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we might not be wrestling physical enemies, but we are wrestling in a spiritual warfare. So we are wrestling tonight. And see, the enemy knows that it's hard to experience God's best when we're blind. In other words, a lot of times our success is dependent on our self-awareness. Now, I know there's a lot of people in here right now might be watching online that might already be shutting me down. But have you ever noticed that the only time that seems to be a problem that people have is whenever we start talking about spirituality? If you're traveling down the road and you don't know where you are... You don't know how it relates to where you're going or how far away you are from where you're trying to get to, then you're going to do whatever it takes and everything in your power to figure it out so you can get to where you're going. But as soon as a preacher or a teacher stands up and says, we need to be aware of where we are spiritually, here come the crickets. And here come the comments. I better tell me I need to know where I'm at. He don't know who he's talking to. But see, when we try to super spiritualize ourselves, then we're setting ourselves up for failure because we all have areas where we need to grow. In a lot of places, people will shout you down when you say nobody's perfect until we see where we ain't perfect. Whoa. But the truth is, our spiritual success is dependent on our spiritual self-awareness. And this is why it's so important for all of us who want to experience the abundant life Jesus wants us to experience, we've got to have an attitude that says and admits that there are things about me that I can't see that at times are hurting me. Amen, Brother John. That's good preaching right there. There are things about me that I can't see that at times are hurting me. Now, how many will be honest enough to admit that I have made some decisions in my life that did not turn out the way I thought they would? It did not end up being a good decision. And if I had only known what I know now, maybe I'm the only one that says, said anything like that before, but if I'd have known then what I know now, things would have turned out a whole lot different. Maybe it's just me. So I'm going to be honest enough to admit that some things about me that I didn't know hurt and hindered me in that season, right? All right. So this is an area that I believe that God wants to perform surgery on because it's affecting people's assignment and hindering their ability to walk in the flourishing and thriving life that God intended for us to have. There's an area that's like a weed in the garden. It's choking out vision. 
It's choking out values. It's choking out the vitality of our life. It's an emotional issue. It's an emotional epidemic that is causing extreme trouble in the world we live in. And the issue is that most people who are being destroyed by it don't even know they got it. It can't be seen and it can't be touched. But it's undeniable and it's very impactful. I'm talking about insecurity. Now, I know that some people that hear that word, insecurity, are going to immediately turn me out, turn me off, and start thinking, I'm not insecure at all. You missed it this time, Pastor. This is definitely not for me. Let me check my Facebook. Let me check my Instagram. Let me get on Snapchat real quick. Let me click off of this. Let me find somebody else here on this Wednesday night. I need something for what I'm going through right now. So for all those who might be feeling that, way whether you in here online wherever you may be let me go old school for a second here hold up wait a minute let me put some Jesus in it <laughs> see <laughs> you can't say you don't know how that you don't have the sickness if you don't know the symptoms so before anybody can say like I did I'm not insecure before we say there ain't even a hint of insecurity in me before we can totally dismiss it as irrelevant for me let me talk for a minute about the symptoms because see the thing is insecurity does not show up looking like insecurity first Peter 5 8 says your adversary be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, what we've got to understand is a lion is an ambush predator. In other words, he waits in the shadows for his opportune time to jump out. You see, so we got to be aware of that. He hides and then he pounces. See, most sicknesses don't show up looking like the sickness. The lion just don't step out there and say, hey, I'm fixing to eat you, dear, so come on over here so I can grab a hold of you and kill you. He'll wait in the shadows. It won't look like the lion's there, and then he pounces. In other words, sicknesses don't show up looking like the sickness. The sickness shows up looking like the symptoms. And when people don't understand this, they begin to treat the symptoms. If you got a headache, and you treat it like just a headache, but you really got the flu, that Tylenol ain't helping the sickness. It's helping a symptom. So what I'm trying to say tonight is that there are times that we're not realizing that we're treating the fruit and not the root. And the fruit is just an expression of the root. And the root of insecurity a lot of times lives in a part of our hearts that we can't see. You can see fruit, but you can't see roots. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You can see the fruit, but you can't see the root. So my prayer is, my Lord, help me to see me. I've gone through too much not to see me. I've sacrificed too much not to see me. I've been broken too much not to see me. Is anybody with me so far? God has taught me too much. He has rearranged me, rebuilt me, corrected me, delivered me. He has humbled me. He has me he has molded me he has formed me he has changed me so my prayer is God go ahead and give me everything you have for me when I stepped in a new day I step into a new day so if it is truly a new day then I want a new day is that all right am I the only one if I step into a new day then that's exactly what I want so Lord keep on working on me is there anybody here who wants the Lord to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even imagine in other words Lord show me me Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Show me things that are going to help me grow from faith to faith, from level to level, from glory to glory. Take the scales off my eyes. I want more than external vision. I need internal vision. Open not just my eyes, but open the eyes of my heart. Lord, please show me me. 
Because insecurity can be hiding in our hearts, and we don't even know it. <laughs> now, I need for us to see something. Go ahead and put up that slide for me, Steve. Now, there's four different me's. I need four volunteers as well. I need four volunteers. Come on, give me some volunteers. Here, you be open me. You can be hidden me. I need two more. All right? You can be blind me, and you can be unknown me. Come here, open me. You come up here. You hidden me. You come up here. You blind over here, and you unknown right there for me. Will you do that? All right. Now, you see, there's four different me's, church. First, there's the open me. Now, here we got my brother Steve. He's, he's representing the open me. See, that's things that you know about you and others know about you. Right. You see, I like baseball. I don't like birds. <laughs> I'm open. That's the open me. You see, yeah, I know that and you know that. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yeah. All right, now, then you got another me that's called the hidden me. That's my brother Timmy up there. Now, this ain't bad. It's just facts. Because, see, this is stuff that you know about you that other people don't know about you. There's things about each of us that nobody else knows. See, there's things that you've chosen not to share. Now, please don't everybody try to act like you ain't got one of these. Because everybody got a hidden me on the inside of me. All right, now, hmm. Boy, it's, it's, it's about to get good now, because then we got the blind me. You see, we got the blind me. Now, that's stuff that you don't know. <laughs> now, watch this, but everybody else does, or others do know. <laughs> see, <laughs> you can't see it, but other people can. Now, look at me for a minute, everybody. You got to hear me for a minute because this is why, young people, pay attention here. You got to be very cautious when we pick our friends. We got to be very cautious, church, as to who we do life with because the people who are going to be the ones who see your blind me are going to be mostly friends. And I know some people might be thinking, what about my wife? What about my husband? Well, let me just say this. Okay, if you married, then your spouse should also be your friend. I hope you didn't marry an assignment. I hope you didn't marry an associate. I hope you married a friend. Because friendship is the foundation of a healthy relationship. Because, see, only friends can keep vows. <laughs> Better or worse is only kept by friends, folks. Only friends will ride with you for better or worse. Proverbs 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times. That ain't up there. Don't worry, bro. <laughs> Only friends will look at you and they'll say, now you wrong, <laughs> but you're still my friend. Now I'm going to defend you and I'm going to cover you in public. But when all this is said and done, we're going to have to have a talk about this <laughs> in private. <laughs> See, this is why picking your friends and picking your spouse is so important because this is the person and these are the people that are going to have enough access to you to see things about you that you don't even see. And they're going to help you work through those things so you can become the better version of you that you wouldn't become on your own. We need the right people to have the right access in our lives. And then you got the unknown me. <laughs> now this is stuff about you that you don't know, others don't know, but God knows. <laughs> and God will use seasons and situations and circumstances to reveal it to you. Sometimes, Jonah, it takes a well to show you the unknown me. Sometime, Moses, it takes a burning bush to bring out of you the unknown you. Right. Sometimes, David, it takes a giant to show you just how strong you can be. Because, see, sometimes your calling demands things from your life that exposes a gap in you that would not have been exposed if you were not called. <laughs> now, I know this ain't never happened to anybody but me. 
Everybody else has always been so sure and so confident in their calling. And they ain't ever experienced a feeling of not enough. Or a feeling of being overwhelmed by the things God was calling you to do. I know that ain't never happened to nobody in here. So instead of using us as an example, I'll just use Moses. <laughs> See, God's calling on Moses exposed the speech issue. Now, when this happened, when the speech issue happened, we could talk about it for hours. <laughs> but when God called Moses, most of us know that Moses said, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And see, that don't matter if I ain't a speaker. <laughs> but sometimes a column puts a demand on you that exposes a deficit that you didn't know you had. <laughs> Are you with me? So here it is. You ready for this? <laughs> insecurity can live in any one of these four areas, but for most of us, insecurity is living in the blind me and the unknown me. Because insecurity don't always show up looking like insecurity. <laughs> now, I know that there's some people who know who they are and know where they are in certain areas, and they're telling people about certain things. I'm struggling with getting in shape. I'm struggling in the area of relationships. I'm having a hard time in my finances right now. Sometimes I feel not good enough. I feel less than. I'm struggling in my progress. So some people are in the open me with some things. But most people are not in the open me with their insecurity. When they feel insecure, if they know it's insecurity, they hide it. <laughs> but the fact is that most people who have insecurity are living in the blind me. Blind to it and they don't even know it's there. <laughs> but what happens is... Now, I know right now we ain't shouting, but hopefully we're learning something. If you're getting anything, just wave at me. Just wave at me. Are you getting anything out here? So here's the issue. The roots of insecurity live in the blind me and the unknown me. But the fruits of insecurity show up in the hidden me and the open me. And so there's people who are in your life who are seeing and dealing with all this fruit. And they don't know where the fruit's coming from. But the fruit's coming from the roots that's in the other areas, the blind me and the unknown me. So they're dealing with these fruits over being, uh, of being oversensitive in certain areas. Of being a loose cannon. Having to walk on eggshells around you at times. Right. Anger, jealousy, competitiveness. Yeah. And we wonder, where's this coming from? But you don't even realize that this is fruit that's coming from roots of insecurity that's either that are in the other me's. And sometimes the roots in the blind me or the unknown me, and we don't even know it. I'm not really mad, I'm insecure. I'm not really position scared, I'm insecure. I'm not really jealous, I'm insecure. I'm not really sad, I'm insecure. I'm not really scared, I'm insecure. I know I can do this, then why ain't you doing it? I know you can do it, and if you're not doing it, then what's really going on? If you deserve better or you're, and you're not going after it or you accept second best or less than God's best for you, then what's really going on? If you know you can do something, then why haven't you done it? If God is calling you to do something, then why haven't you done it? Now get this. All over here in the open me, we got all sorts of excuses as to why we ain't doing what God's called us to do or what we're supposed to be doing. All over here, it ain't the right time. All over here, this ain't happening or that ain't happening. All over here, he this, she that. All over here, we got all these excuses and all these things going on. Now, sometimes that might be the case. Don't get me wrong. Now, I'm not saying it's never the case. Sometimes it is. But a lot of times, the fruits in the open me, the excuses and the things we say, but the roots over here and the roots over here, I'm insecure. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. 
Let me have your cards here. <laughs> Let's give our volunteers a hand. Thank you, guys. Let's see if I can put that right over there for me. All right. <laughs> So the thing about this thing called insecurity, church, is that it not only affects and infects our peace, it also gets in the way of us fulfilling our purpose. And we've got to arrest insecurity. <laughs> not just so that we will have peace, but so we'll walk in purpose. You see, we got to get control over insecurity, not just so we can feel better, but so we can do better. we got to capture insecurity, not just so we can have a don't care attitude, but so we can do what we're called and what we're gifted to do. We've got to control insecurity because insecurity is a killer and is sent by the enemy to kill our assignment. Watch this. Remember the purpose of the enemy, John 10.10. 10. The thief comes not before to steal, kill, and destroy. And when the enemy can't kill the assignment with moral failures, then the enemy will kill our assignment with insecurity. It makes you afraid to do what you're gifted and called to do. Last Wednesday night, Katie stood up in front of a crowd of people and she talked to us about fear. All the while, she's dealing with the same fear she's talking about. See, the enemy was trying to make her afraid to do what she's been gifted to do. Can I run a little rabbit trail right here really quick? See, that's what makes those Wednesday, Wednesday nights so important. we got to help train the next generation, church, before the enemy tries to kill their gifts and their callings through insecurity. We ain't raising up a generation of weak, scared, and fearful Christians. We're raising up a generation of mighty warriors. We're raising up giant killers, Red Sea crossing, enemy fighting, victorious saints of God. That's our mission, church. That's what makes that so important. But the enemy tries to make you hesitate to do what you anointed to do. And then when you finally do it, you do it timidly and not boldly. And David, you don't kill a giant tiptoeing around it. Preach, Holy Ghost. You don't kill a giant tiptoeing around a giant. You don't kill a giant by saying, I think I'm just going to throw this rock and it might hit him in the forehead and I really hope it does. Oh man, I, I, it might. I'm just thinking it, it just could. You kill a giant by saying, you come at me with sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the living God. I don't think so. I don't hope so. I know so because my God is with me and the battle's not mine. The battle's his. I'm telling somebody tonight, this is bold living season for you. I ain't saying be arrogant. I'm not saying to be cocky. But I am telling you, Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God started it, then God will finish it. You gave this situation to God, rest knowing he can handle it. You raise those kids the way the Lord said to, rest assured that his word will come to pass. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they old, they won't depart from it. David said, you come at me with your weapons, but I come at you because I'm a worshiper and I have the Lord a host on my side and he did what he was supposed to do church catch this why because he felt like his rock was enough do you feel like your rocks enough hmm. see until we capture insecurity we can't get a clear vision of what our assignment is so some people are like I don't know my purpose I don't know what I'm supposed to do and some people can't get clear because insecurity is blinding their discernment. And for those who's wondering what I'm talking about, we see it all in the text we read at the beginning. What we read in Jeremiah. Everything we've been talking about is in the text. Everything that I have said is in the story we read. See, we get to look back at a conversation between God and a man named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is considered a major prophet. Not because he was more this or more that. It just means God gave him more to say. So there's some books of the Bible that are smaller. you got Zechariah, you got Amos, you got Hosea, you got things like that. And they're called minor prophets. And then there's some books that's bigger like Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. They're called major prophets because God gave him more to say. But the thing is, for the most part, 
the people he gave the most to say are the same people he had to wrestle with the most to say it. <laughs> it's right there in the text. God shows Jeremiah his assignment. He's telling Jeremiah the reason why he was created, and God is inviting Jeremiah to line up his life with God's will and God's plan. Now watch this, because I believe this conversation shows us something who's looking for a clear vision of what our calling is. What are you supposed to do, both inside and outside the church? What's God's calling for my life? I want to give you a definition of what God's calling is. All right, you ready? God's calling is God's invitation for your joining in in the reason why you was created. <laughs> and here's something to think about. Your assignment will require some alignment. Mm. Now, y'all know that I'm pretty upfront and I'm kind of a bold person. And this is the kind of church we can just get right down there where we live because we're grown. And we can handle some stuff that other people in other places can't handle, right? All right. But there's a lot of people who seem to think that the assignment don't require any alignment. Go ahead. Everything you want to do is what you're supposed to do. They act like the assignment doesn't require them putting their wants and their desires to death. I can come and go as I please. I can do what I want to do. I can still do everything and everything I want to do and be everything God wants me to do. And what I want to do is exactly what God wants me to do. But can I tell you something? Your assignment will require you to line your heart and your mind and your spirit with God's heart and God's mind and God's spirit. And there's some things that you will have to lay on the altar of convenience. There's some things you'll have to lay on the altar of my wants and my desires because your assignment will require you to put some wants and some desires to death and not just putting them on the altar but keeping them on the altar. There's going to be some things that you want to do with your life and some ways you want to go with your life that might not be evil. Hmm. But they just don't line up with God's plan. And when you get to those places where God shows you what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go in certain seasons, then you've got to be willing to lay aside your wishes and say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Your assignment will require some alignment. It will require you to put some wishes and some preferences on the altar and to keep them there. See, Abraham didn't just put Isaac on the altar. He tied him down. Mm -hmm. And this is for somebody who's wondering why some things seem like a recurring cycle and why they have to keep battling the same wishes and desires over and over and over again. Why you seem to fight the same battles in the same fights. Moses, why we keep running around the same mountains? Because there's some things that you just can't lay on the altar. you got to tie them down on the altar. See, a lot of times we bring it to the altar and we lay it down, and that's great. Please don't get me wrong, but there are some things that you got to tie it down because in a later season, that thing that you laid there is going to want to get right back up and come after you again. That's why Paul said, I die daily. And I know I might be killing some sacred cows right here, but I ain't necessarily talking about just sin or evil or bad things. I'm talking about anything that keeps you from giving what God has called you to do the time and the attention it takes to do it. Hmm. Now, most of you know my story. Most of you know that I love coaching, and I love coaching baseball. I did it for over 20 years, and I loved it. I tried to hold on to it even after a new day was formed. I still can't watch youth baseball without trying to coach. Y'all think I'm joking. We went out a few Fridays ago, went and got a banana split. That was good, too. <laughs> went down to Creekside Park, and there were some young folks playing baseball. And I was looking around. I was like, why ain't they showing them this? Why ain't they telling them that? Why ain't they doing this? You see, I still like to coach. And you can call it bragging. You can call it what you want to, but I was good at it. And I believe I can still be good at it. 
I gave it everything I had because that's the way I am. If you don't want me to give it my all, don't ask me to do it. I wouldn't let my kids win at Candyland. <laughs> I've told you this before. My wife to this day refuses to play games with me and my kids. <laughs> we got one gear, go hard or go home. And when I was coaching, I went after it every day. But see, here's my point. When New Day was formed, I began to realize I did not have the time to put into it what it took to be what I wanted to be. So I didn't just have to lay it on the altar. I had to tie it down. <laughs> you see, I didn't just have to lay it on the altar. I had to tie it down. Now, I'm trying to be blunt so somebody can get free. I had to tie it down, church. So you got to see, I was looking at something that was not evil. It was not sin. And I wanted to do it. It was something I feel like I'm gifted to do. And I could do it. And not only could I do it, I believe I could do it good. Something that came real easy for me, a lot easier than a whole lot of other things. But I had to tie it down. Because your assignment requires alignment. Nevertheless, not my will. Nevertheless, no matter what I want, not my will. But yours be done. Put it on the altar and tie it down now let me make it personal I like to sleep, tie it down I don't like to read, tie it down I don't have time, tie it down I can't, tie it down I won't, tie it down I don't want, tie it down put it on the altar and tie it down because my assignment requires some alignment and God will give you what you need to do everything he has called you to do but you got to manage it if I'm ever going to be all that God wants me to be, then it will require me to lay down my wants, my desires, my mentalities, and my insecurities. This was the case with Jesus, and it will be the case with us. We got to align our wishes and our will with God. He's our creator. He's our designer. He knows what I'm best suited for. Please get this, church. He knows what will give us the most joy. So that's where a lot of people miss it. They put their success and their joy together, but you can't do that. <laughs> See, I can tell you what I could have done if I'd have kept coaching, but if it was not the will of God, I could have done all that but had no joy. <laughs> I could have went that route and been a drunk. I could have had all that and my family be torn apart. I could have had all that and my marriage fell apart. You see, I could have done that and God look at what he gave me and say, look, I gave you that talent so it's really mine. <laughs> and you really just stewarded the talent. So you do with it what I tell you to do with it. And he could have said, please catch this. God could have said, I will only breathe on what you've been called to. Oh, my Lord, somebody say preach. <laughs> I'm only going to breathe on what you've been called to. You see, there's a story in the Bible about the disciples going fishing. Now, remember, a lot of these disciples were fishermen by trade. That's their job what they did for a living. Now please don't get me wrong, online family, anybody in here, I ain't saying that fishing's evil. Ain't nothing wrong with fishing, it ain't evil, and they did it for a living. So they had to be pretty good at it, right? But they fished all night and they caught nothing. So even if you're gifted for it, when you step outside of what he's called you to do, when he's called you to do it, because there ain't nothing wrong with fishing, but then was not the time to fish. So he quit breathing on that, and favor will not be on that, and it'll not be as fulfilling, as fruitful as you think, because it ain't about you. It ain't your talent. It's his that he gave you. It's about you stewarding what he's given you. It's about God. And sometimes we can't walk in God's calling because we've created our own. <laughs> I 
we like doing something and we enjoy it, so it's got to be God, right? <laughs> I'm a missionary to the Caribbean. Glory to God, hallelujah. <laughs> See, God tells Jeremiah he got to work for him. And it ain't going to be easy work, Jeremiah, because you're going to have to change people's minds. And you're going to have to try to free them from certain patterns and certain thought processes that they think about God. Because all assignments are not equal. See, that's why I always say, and that's why I know that New Day ain't for everybody. Because some people are satisfied with status quo and complacency. And they want Mary had a little lamb. And they don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be pushed. And they just want to sit in the boat and not get up. And that's okay. Because all assignments ain't equal. It ain't my assignment to tell you that this old world is just going to get worser and worser until one day Jesus is going to step out on a cloud and take us up out of here. But until then, we're just going to have to make the most out of a bad situation. That ain't my assignment. I'm not faulting anybody in their assignment, but I just know that ain't my assignment. My assignment is to tell you that as long as there is one Christian in this world, there is hope. Because there is one, that means Jesus is still here. And if he's here, there is hope. And there is hope as long as he's in the, in the world. So we got to rise up and make a difference while it's day. Yes, the night's coming when no man can work. But while it's day, we can make a difference. But it's going to take work. And it's going to take commitment. And it's going to take dedication. We can make a difference. See, that is our assignment. So God, when God gives Jeremiah his assignment, Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. We got to see how Jeremiah answers. Jeremiah says two things. Y'all ready for this? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. You missed it. God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I don't know how to speak and I'm too young. God says, I'm going to use you to pull up. I'm going to use you to tear down. I don't know how to speak and I'm too young. God invites Jeremiah to use his life for his glory, for his purpose, and Jeremiah responds with his insecurity. This is for somebody tonight. When God calls, who's answering? <laughs> because sometimes when God calls, insecurity answers. Now watch this. Notice what Jeremiah's actually saying. I can't speak. I don't have the ability. I can't. I'm not able. And I don't have the experience. I'm too young. So what is Jeremiah telling God? I can't. I don't have the ability. And I'm not experienced enough. Is everybody with me? I don't have the ability and I don't have the experience. Oh, my Lord. Am I the only one that at this point in time, the message just jumped up, slapped me in the head and said, pay attention to what I'm saying. Because the fact is, there was a whole nation waiting on Jeremiah to say yes. Who's being held up because you holding back? Who's being held captive because you holding back? Who's not reaching their potential because you unwilling to step into yours? Mm. Now watch this. Jeremiah's talking to God about stuff he's projecting on God. That ain't a priority to God. Jeremiah's like, I'm too young. And God's like, I didn't say anything about that. I can't speak. God's like, I didn't say anything about that. <laughs> it's powerful. In other words, what God's saying to Jeremiah is, you confusing our guidelines. You're getting them mixed up because you think your guidelines and mine are the same. So his insecurity is trying to kill his assignment. Now think about it. If God would have let him out of him, let him off the hook, and then he walked away, if God would have been like, all right, yep, you're right, you, you, you're right, if that would have happened, we'd not be reading about him. Right. And if his, if his insecurity would have gotten in the way, we would have not known that even prophets at times feel like we do. Jeremiah 20 and 9. 
Then he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Anybody ever been there? I ain't doing this no more. I don't want nothing to do with it. I am tired. I am fed up. I will not do this anymore. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. In other words, he felt the same way we've all felt at times. I don't feel, I don't feel this. I don't feel that. But his word is like a fire shut up in my bones. If he had let his insecurity rob him of his assignment, we would not have the revelation of Jeremiah 29 when in the middle of despair, when in the middle of destruction, God sends a word and he says in 2911, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You see, we would not have had that if he would have let insecurity kill his purpose. So Jeremiah steps into his calling. Not because of his greatness, but because of God's goodness. <laughs> My Lord. <laughs> See, Jeremiah steps into his calling because God wouldn't stop calling. <laughs> he stepped into his calling because God wouldn't leave him alone. He stepped in his calling because God would not let insecurity answer for Jeremiah. He stepped into his calling because God refused to let Jeremiah operate in a place of less than God's best for his life. Because insecurity is a killer. I'm trying to close. I'm almost, I'm, almost, I'm almost closing. What does insecurity kill? Number one, our sanity. Jeremiah is going through some unneeded anxiety about something he was born to do. Mm, because insecurity will make you worry for no reason. What if they don't like me? What if it don't go good? What if I get up there and it just stink up the place? I'm going to be so embarrassed. So his insecurity is killing, number one, his sanity. Number two, insecurity will also damage our relationships. We feel like others might abandon us or they, don't, they might not hang out with us <laughs> and they might not want to be around us. And what happens a lot of times, insecurity will cause us to overcompensate. And so when we're supposed to be a peacemaker or a peace bringer, we become a peace killer or a peace taker. We're supposed to be bringing peace, but we'll take it because insecurity will kill our assignment because purpose will add value and not take it away. See, when we're walking in purpose, we'll be an asset in other people's lives, not a liability. Yeah. Number three, insecurity will hinder your success. It not only gets in the way of us accepting our assignment, it also impacts the way you execute your assignment. Insecurity will cause you to execute your assignment being timid. Please hear me, there's a difference between being humble and being timid. See, Paul had to tell Timothy this. He said, Timothy, I know you're young. But, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. There's a whole lot more to this church. I'm going to close, but tonight we're looking at what it is and what it does. Sunday we're going to look at some doing it. <laughs> because the whole purpose of tonight is this. You cannot solve something you cannot see. We got to see it. So here's my question. How's your sanity? Are you at peace in your heart and in your life right now? Now, I ain't talking about the mask you wear. I ain't talking about the things you post on social media. How are you, really? How's your relationships? How are you executing your assignment? How is your success? Because maybe, just maybe, some of us tonight are like me. Maybe we've discovered that there might be just a little bit of insecurity inside of us that just hadn't showed up looking like insecurity. See, there's a lot of things we've misdiagnosed of over the years. Most of the time, arrogance is insecurity. <laughs> it's just insecurity faking it. <laughs> So arrogance showing up in the open me, but it's really it was insecurity in the unknown me. And God wants to break some things off of us. Because, see, here's the thing, church. I need you to walk in your purpose. 
please hear me. God gave you a gift. And some of you might get offended by this, but you owe us that. He gave you gifts for the body. Those talents are not for you. He didn't give you that for you. Your gifts are for his glory, but they're for to serve his body and his people. See, the purpose of New Day is to raise up people who are not changed by the world, but the world is changed through them. We want to help as many as possible as we can to help change their life so they can change the world they live in. That's what our assignment is around here. We don't do church as normal. We don't do form and fashion. We want to be the best version of ourselves, not so people can brag on us, but so we can change the world we live in. And we cannot fully do that until everybody is walking in their gifts and walking in their calling. So tonight we look at what it is. Sunday we're going to look at capturing it. But tonight let's all stand. Come on musicians. And I know tonight's been different. We ain't run the aisles. But what we've done is we've looked at some things that affects all of us, young or old. Rich or poor, save 10 days, save 10 years. I know there were some people in this room that this was speaking directly to. I believe for some of us, our eyes have been opened up to things we didn't even know was there. So here's what I want to do. I want everybody to bow your heads for just a minute. I know it's Wednesday night. But I got one question, then I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to open the altar. I'm going to ask you to come. The question's simple, and it goes for everybody. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. Pastor, tonight I saw some things on the inside of me I really didn't even realize was there. Some things were shown tonight that I know I need prayer for. I've been dealing with insecurity, and I knew it, or I had no idea. It doesn't matter. If this message spoke to you in any way, just slip up your hand and say, pray for me. Thank God, hands going up all over the building. The Holy Ghost is in this place tonight. He wants to do some surgery. Huh. Hey, Pastor, wow, I've been wondering why certain people close to me have, act, have acted in certain ways. I can see now that it's been the fruit of insecurity, and I want to pray for them. Is that you? Slip your hand up. Thank God these hands are going up. Huh. Tonight I'm going to pray a prayer of deliverance. I know that God's a God of process, but I also believe God's still a God of miracles. I'm going to pray that the stronghold of insecurity is broken off because it's killing some of our assignments. Father, in the name of Jesus, for everybody who's wrestling with this and they didn't even know it, it's attacking their sanity, it's tearing their relationships apart, it's hindering their success. Tonight, I pray that the God who sets us free will set us free from this trap of insecurity. And as you were setting people free, draw them to come themselves and give it to you what they can't fix themselves. Lord, we're praying that it be said of us what was said of the early church. It was these who turned the world upside down. In Jesus' name. If you raise your hand, would you come? This altar's open. Would you come? Don't worry about who sees what, who says what, or what else is going on. If you lifted your hand, you need to be on this altar. Insecurity is a stronghold that needs to be torn down.
Serve a good God. Praise the Lord. I'm mm, glad we came to church on a Wednesday night. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand for what He's done in this service tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm. All hearts clear this evening. Praise the Lord. Mm. I, I appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, again, I pray the, that uh, you've been blessed through the, through the word, through the song, through just by being in the presence of other saints of God. Praise the Lord. Um, please don't forget about everything we have going on. We've got so much happening. Um, we've got a couple of, uh, well, actually one conference and one gathering. See, I'm getting good at separating that. I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> But, uh, huh? yes, I feel safe at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our men's conference is coming up on the 12th of September. All men, it's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. Uh, starts at 10 a.m. Um, the women's gathering will be on September the 26th. All ladies, please come out and be a part of that. Um, we do have t shirts available. If you like any of those, please uh, uh, please see the appropriate people for that. Window decals, yes, we do have more window decals available. Uh, we haven't mentioned them in a few weeks. Uh, they are ten bucks a piece. They are sharp. They are nice. Uh, if you haven't got one, please get one. Uh, they're like I say, they're beautiful, and it's also good advertising for our church. Praise the Lord. Uh, Shabbat coming up soon. Uh, we do have a list that's uh, growing, and uh, so the, ob the goal is this year to get a cabin. So it's going to be amazing, going to be a great time. You don't want to miss it. If you'd like to go be a part, if you haven't signed up, please see Des. She's getting it together because she got it together. <laughs> so uh, am I missing anything? Sunday night, talent and testimony service. Yes, going to be amazing. You don't want to miss that. Come out. We've got a lot of people lined up to share. Going to have uh, going to have a good time. Come out be a part. Next Saturday, the You Slip and Slide. If you don't know where we're going, please see Michael Dez. They will let you know where it is, how to get there, and all that. So come out, slip, slide, and eat a hot dog. That'd be fun. You'll enjoy it. I'm going to go eat a hot dog, but I'm going to forego the slipping and sliding. I'm going to let y'all do all that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I might slip and slide down the hill without a slip and slide. I'm getting old. So. <laughs> I, told, I told Michael and Des, I said, I have uh, foregone that. I have, I, I passed that on. I don't miss that part of it. So <laughs> not at this point, but praise the Lord. All hearts clear tonight. Then, uh, don't forget about the services Sunday. Come out and be a part. 9.30 corporate prayer, 10 a.m. Sunday school. Morning worship at 11. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask Sister Desiree Lucy if she would dismiss us in prayer.